we have with us today uh, Veronique Lambert, Doug Abbott, and Scott Thatch. Uh, they will be sharing with us the Power Safe Schools program through Sustainable Jersey for Schools. Uh, Veronique, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Mike, I'm sure you've never been more nervous saying those words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not at all. Well, Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And I would actually advise you not to copy Veronique about how to access a WebEx call because I think I just did a demonstration and everything not to do. But I'm happy to be the, the foil for the start of the, um, the webinar. Um, so, yeah, this afternoon I'm with um, uh, Scott and Doug, my uh, partners from Power Safe Schools, in implementing um, a program that actually connects very nicely with the organization that I work with, which is Sustainable Jersey for Schools, um, to where we certify schools for being sustainable. So I'm kind of going to give like an introduction to the overall, our overall program and what we do, and then I'm going to segue into a specific part of it that connects to the Power Safe Schools program, and then hand it over to Doug and Scott. So um, the overall you know, title of our talk is we want to educate people and change their behaviors to save energy. And we're going to talk about how we do that in uh, schools in New Jersey. Okay, so I'm Veronique Lambert. I'm the program coordinator at Sustainable Jersey for Schools. Um, I, unfortunately, I can't, uh, I don't know who's on the call right now, so I don't have a sense if any of you are um, familiar with the program or may even be from districts already participating. Um, but if you're not, then I will spend a little time going over that program. And then um, my uh, partners from Alliance to Save Energy are Doug Abbott and Scott Thatch, and uh, they will be talking to you in greater detail about um, what the work they do with Alliance to Save Energy. Okay, so just briefly, uh, just to you know, set the context that we're talking about, uh, just to make sure that you guys know what Sustainable Jersey is. So we're a, a really a nonprofit. A lot of people mistake. Uh, uh, through our name, they think we're like a state agency. We're not. We're actually an independent nonprofit. We do work a lot in collaboration with various agencies, both in the government and also outside the government. Actually, NJEA is a strong partner um, in helping us both design and implement this program. Uh, so what we do, we're, we're free uh, and voluntary. So there's no charge to participate in the program, and there's no obligation. So school districts would choose to do this because they want to and they think it's a good opportunity for them to get recognized, maybe for the work they're already doing, or they want to tap into um, the tools, resources, and guidance that we offer through our program to help schools either do what they're already doing better or maybe even undertake entirely new initiatives and programs. Um, we're also very committed to raising money for grant funding um, because we do recognize that schools may want to do a lot of cool things, but sometimes um, money gets in the way of actually being able to do it. So we do fundraise. We have uh, corporate uh, sponsors. We also do um, have some private foundations that fund us. And then, of course, we also just ourselves will uh, do grant writing and get some grants from government or pri uh, agencies or, or private organizations. So that's an Im important um, aspect of our work is to fundraise and, uh, and offer that grant funding to help schools do some of the good work. And there's a picture there of um, representatives from Jackson School District. They got all 10 of their schools certified actually for multiple years in a row. And actually, they do a fair bit of work in the energy realm. Um, and one of the people in the picture is actually John Blair, who is like their energy education and outreach specialist um, in that school district. So um, if you, you know, we're not, we're interested in finding out more or even wanted to know if you, your particular school district was already participating. Um, I'll show you how you can find that on the map. Uh, we actually, the schools program is based off of a very successful municipal certification program. And you'll see that on the map to the left. We already have 80% of towns in New Jersey that are participating. Um, the schools program is a bit newer. We are five, we've been around for five years, and in that five years, we already have about, you know, almost 60% of the um, school districts, public, and this is public schools. So we only work with public schools in New Jersey. 
Uh, so about 60% of the school districts are already participating. And you'll see the numbers over here um, on your right that the total of 351 districts and in those districts, 948 schools. Um, and so far we have 241 schools that are certified. Um, so is your district participating? Well, I, I couldn't tell you, but if you came to our website and at the bottom of each slide there, you'll see the, the address to get to our website, sustainablejerseyschools.com. Uh, there's a little like a schematic drawing of a, a map of New Jersey on the map on, right there on the homepage. You click on that and it will open up a page that will show you every single district and school in New Jersey that's already participating. And you can search that list and see if you can find your district on there. Um, a, you might be surprised that you might think your district is not participating and you might go on there and realize that they are. So I would encourage you to do that um, if, you, if you don't already know. Okay, um, and then uh, once you get to that map, you could also filter it to see how many of the districts are bronze and silver certified. We have two levels of certification. And people ask us a lot, well, you know, why should we do this? You know, we're already so busy. We have so many things to do in the realm of schools. Um, and so some of the reasons, the most tangible one, of course, is that you have access to our grants because only schools that are registered with us can apply for grants. But then you also have access to this whole roadmap of different ways that, or different actions that you can take to be sustainable, including whether it's, you know, in the energy realm or educating students or how you manage uh, your grounds and your facilities or, um, you know, health, health and wellness. Um, and then, of course, gaining recognition. Who doesn't like to be recognized for the good work that they're doing? Um, and once you participate, then you're part of this statewide movement. You know, in addition to 241 schools that are certified, we have the close to 900 schools that are participating. And we often, um, you know, well, we used to until the uh, social distancing um, gather at different, you know, state and regional um, conferences and events. Um, and to you know, showcase what schools around the state are doing. But we'll do a little bit of that now um, online. So uh, this is just like a screenshot of our brochure. And this is also on our website, actually. Um, so I, I didn't, it doesn't show the full thing, but what I'm, what I'm trying to get across here is the great number of, of what we call actions or the different things that schools can do on their journey towards being more sustainable. And you can see it's very broad. Um, you know, it's not just the traditional uh, actions that people think tend to think of, which is like you know, saving energy or having school gardens or having clean water. It's also looking at things like you know, student and staff wellness. Um, you know, policy support, physical activity, or you know, your learning environment. Are you offering the arts? You know, some people may not think that arts are connected to sustainability, but we look at sustainability as being very broad. So there's a lot of different ways that you could plug into this. Um, we find that when we talk to schools around the state and people who are working in those schools, everybody from, you know, teachers to um, parents to administrators to um, our facilities, people, you know, they are just school nurses. They will find something that they're doing that plugs into this uh, framework of sustainability and find a way that they can contribute. So. So that was kind of like setting, you know, the wider stage theme for sustainability. And now I'm going to show you how, you know, getting down eventually to what we're talking about, but showing you how more broadly our energy actions are actually a very substantial component of those 90 plus actions. So um, we have actions that what we that are kind of targeted more to like the facilities and operations realm. And that's looking at things from like you know, energy tracking and management. I would say this is also impacts the um, like the business office because uh, energy tracking and management is kind of like looking at your utility bills. You know, um, energy efficiency for school facilities is looking at upgrades uh, to things like lighting fixtures or HVAC systems. And using that, you can actually tap into the New Jersey Clean Energy Program incentives. Um, and if you got if anybody in the call is interested in that. There's a lot more information. Um, we have recorded webinars uh, that I can point you to if you want to reach out to me afterwards. Um, and then, you know, of course, some, some schools have solar panels or geothermal installations. 
um, or we even have some larger districts that have their own fleet. So either like, for example, in the case of Jackson, their energy manager uh, actually has a car. It's a, an electric car or a, I can't remember if it's electric or hybrid that he drives, that he needs to drive around because it's a pretty large district. Or if some districts um, either through their school buses, if they have like electric or propane, uh, some cleaner fuel bus. So these are the ones that are more energy and more facilities operations and business administrator. But then we get into the actions that connect to um, student engagement and to uh, working with people and how, what they do in essence, like how they engage with the community or how, you know, students and staff learn. And so this is really about kind of teaching, uh, trying to impact change through engaging people and raising awareness and educating them. And right at the top of this list is the uh, action that we're gonna be focused on, which is this behavior-based energy conservation program. It's a mouthful and it sounds a bit odd, but you know, we'll break it down for you and you probably already have some sense of what it means just by uh, the title. So um, when we say behavior-based, it's, uh, it's basically, <laughs> Saying that we're focusing on the, it's almost like the, psycho, the psychological element, right? So we're looking to save energy, not through the physical um, changes and upgrades to your physical plant or structure. So in, in terms of getting, you know, uh, upgraded lighting or doing upgrades to your HVAC system. Um, this is really with saying with what we have in place now, with no changes to um, to our systems or to our physical plant, how can we uh, save energy? And why is it so important to save energy? Well, the, the thing that really resonates with most districts is because it saves them money, right? Because you have to pay money to get that energy into your building. So even if you were not doing it for like, you know, reducing your carbon footprint, you're trying to get carbon out of the atmosphere, you're not doing it for the quote unquote sustainable environmental sustainability reasons, then you can certainly be doing it for the business sustainability reasons. So, uh, you know, the approach that we take is, okay, well, we're in a, in a school environment, so it's already all about education, and you have loads of people there who are interacting, well, used to have, and hopefully one day we'll get back to loads of people interacting um, physics in a physical space. So we engage students and staff to learn about, you, know, you want to educate them about how is energy used in your school? Like where does energy get used? And um, you know, how, how is it being used? Uh, and then how is our, is our movement and how are our, our behaviors in the building impacting that energy use? So we do that through engaging them in hands-on lessons. And this is especially relevant for the students. So the important thing to also um, note about this program is that it is student-led. So we do also see some behavior-based programs that are more, um, that are completely focused on staff. And those are important too, because you do have staff that, you know, especially I would think like the facility staff and maybe also uh, food services that can have a huge impact in how energy is used. But in this particular um, type of approach, it's really pulling the students in to even take the lead in bringing about the change. So the students you know, are engaged in learning about energy through hands-on lessons. And then they're also uh, taught and led through doing audits of the classroom or even the entire building to really figure out like where is energy being used and where, where are the energy hogs, so to speak, in the building. And what are the opportunities for saving energy based on what they find out in these audits through changing behaviors, right? Um, and then another way, another popular way to get the education out, especially to the broader uh, school population. So maybe you're working closely with a smaller classrooms or smaller groups of students, but then you want to get the word out to the larger population. A popular way to do this is through having, uh, you know, school assemblies or some larger presentation if you have a special event um, and you come up with some, you know, catchy either narrative or song or messages to, to get some key points across to the school community about, you know, what are opportunities for saving energy. Um, and 
Then, so I'm going into the next thing, then, then once the students and the staff have learned about how energy is used, then they would come up with ideas of how they can have an energy campaign, or this is kind of like a concerted effort to go out into the community to encourage change of behavior. So now we've learned what we can do, and let's try to actually encourage people to change their behavior. So they'll do this you know, using what they have available in schools, typically it's things like morning announcements, um, putting, making and putting up posters or flyers, email blasts, um, you know, to, that would be to staff, and sometimes even going out to parents. Um, the energy patrol contest is popular. I'm sure uh, Doug and Scott will be well covering that. And then another option, um, this, and this, of course, would include a or require the participation of the, of the facility staff is to do the holiday or break shutdown. So when schools close, like say over the winter break or Easter, sorry, spring break, um, and even over the summer, there's opportunities, even though a lot of school buildings are used over the summer, some of them will have like shortened weeks, then just looking for opportunities to maybe we don't have to run all our systems on full blast for the entire time and we can either turn things down or turn things off and save some energy that way. So um, this just, you know, I've been talking about um, the behavior. So what are some of these behaviors? And I'm pretty sure that Scott and Doug are going to go over this in more detail, but just so that I don't, you know, you're not completely mystified because I've been using this very generic term. Uh, some of the behaviors that we're talking about that we commonly see uh, in schools for saving energy are things like, you know, last one out, turn the lights off, um, turning off computers, smart boards, and other electronic equipment, you know, at the end of the day, um, unplugging electrical equipment to avoid uh, phantom energy, because sometimes even if you're, you turn your computer off, for example, or your television off, um, you'll notice there's still a little light that shines, like say if you have a power strip, so that's still drawing energy. So really sometimes even like unplugging, you know, uh, completely turning everything off, unplugging it. Avoiding overlighting, um, using natural light when available. So we often will see in classrooms that there's just with all the lights on, it's just, it's way more light than, than is necessary. And then this one, um, I had a difficult time summarizing this last point. It, I said support your HVAC system. And it's really because each building is gonna have a slightly different set up and uh, the way things run. So basically it's kind of like knowing how your HVAC system operates, what your natural conditions are, your building, and just try to work with that to support it in the way that it's gonna maximize it and make it most efficient. And some common um, mistakes uh, we can see are things like maybe teachers inadvertently blocking the vents with like stacks of books or the way bookcases placed. Um, be mindful of conditions near a thermostat. So, you know, if you've got like something, you know, blowing hot or cold air that's right near the thermostat, that may be inadvertently driving your HVAC system to operate in a way that's not conducive to what you really need. And then either, you know, closing your doors or windows um, as it makes sense for, you know, the conditions of the building and also supporting the HVAC system. Um, and then there's some other benefits, you know, other than energy savings, uh, when you are implementing some of these changes, uh, for example, say like avoiding overlighting or adjusting the temperatures, you'll find that there's also these other benefits, um, like improved environment for learning and working. So, you know, if it, some of this is common sense, but, you know, obviously if your staff and your students are overheated or too cold, or even if the, you know, it's overlit, um, it can have dire impact uh, consequences on their attention, for example, like some people just would not be able to focus as well in those environments, um, and also just in your uh, health and wellness of both students and staff. So um, this program, Power Safe Schools, that Doug and uh, Scott are going to talk about is one of these, um, it's, it's an result of the partnership with not just Alliance to Save Energy, but also two utility, uh, major utility companies in, in New Jersey. So South Jersey Gas, New Jersey Natural Gas um, are actually partners in offering this program in school districts in the service areas of these two utility companies. Um, and so the Alliance to Save Energy actually works with these schools to 
help them with, you know, the tools, providing the tools and training teachers and how to use these tools and how to use their program in working with students to educate them so the students can then lead this, um, uh, you know, what they call, they call their behavior-based program Power Safe Schools. So the Power Safe Schools is one very powerful example of a very effective behavior-based um, energy conservation program that's currently um, in practice in some New Jersey schools. So I, at this point, um, I think I'll just turn it over to, uh, to to Doug and Scott. I think probably we'll take questions at the very end, unless if there's something that uh, that needs to be uh, clarified or addressed right now. But I just, I just this, this is the contact information. Please, if you have any questions about either sustainable services or schools. If you want to get registered, you have questions about our grants or any of our technical assistance or resources, reach out to me. And I've also thrown up um, uh, contact information for uh, Doug Abbott and Scott back from the lines to save energy. Okay, thanks, Arnique. Uh, I'm going to hand presenter power over to Scott now. And, um, and it might take a moment. So if anybody does have a question, now's an okay time to ask. If any questions are being typed, somebody will have to read it out to me because I don't have view of the um, comments right now. Sure, chat. I can take care of that. Sure. So it looks like all's quiet right now. Um, and okay. Scott is just getting queued up. Scott is muted and I don't know if he realizes that. Am I muted? See Scott, I just unmuted you, so I don't right. know. Uh, you can you hear me? I can. Oh, great, great. And can you see the Empowered <laughs> logo? We're all good. Excellent. Okay. Well, then I'll jump right in. Uh, first of all, um, thank you, Mike, um, for giving us the opportunity to uh, join this presentation. And also, I wanted to thank Veronique uh, for for letting us take part in uh, in well, first of all, for being a fantastic partner, because for the entire time, whoops, let me get that screen clear. For the entire time that we've been working with New Jersey schools, uh, Sustainable Jersey has been, um, and, and Veronique in particular, has been a really great partner. And it's um, wonderful for us to be able to support the broader work that she was just discussing too. She also just did a great job of describing the way that the Power Save program works. So she will be able to give you an overview of the program um, uh, on top of, of what she just mentioned and talk about some of the ways that the program has changed in recent months for obvious reasons. So um, get back over there. Hopefully that slide advanced. So the, uh, the Power Save um, Schools program uh, has, has come out of about 26 years of the Alliance to Save Energy presenting K through 12 education. Um, and one of the sort of driving beliefs of our program um, is that energy use is going to have a huge impact uh, on future generations and particularly on um, our young students today. And so they need to be taught about energy and energy efficiency. Um, and they're also uniquely qualified uh, to help lead the kind of change that's going to ensure um, that we have a, a healthy and prosperous um, energy future uh, and future in general. Um, so the goals of the program are one of the first and foremost goals is to save energy and reduce costs. And those are obviously important um, in their own right, um, especially right now with uh, budgets tight and, and liable to get much tighter. Um, energy represents the second largest expenditure in schools' budgets behind only uh, personnel expenses. So it's more than um, books and computers combined. Um, and so the savings, and there's also about 30% energy waste in the average school. So there's real opportunities just in the savings. But more importantly, I think it's a yardstick of the e efficacy of students' efforts. Um, and another important thing to remember, and Veronique mentioned this, was that everything that students do within the PowerSafe program uh, need to contribute to making 
um, a better, more conducive learning environment. So, which starts with being respectful of uh, people's time, teachers' time, um, and uh, then every energy-saving recommendation that they make, uh, whether it's around lighting or temperature, um, have to make the classrooms a better place to learn. So, the, the analogy that I sometimes draw is uh, to an, an ice cream shop, that you could certainly save a lot of energy uh, by turning off the freezers in an ice cream shop, but then you would utterly undermine the purpose of an ice cream shop. And the school is obviously there to teach and uh, to provide a place to learn. And so it's, it's critically important that everything our students do support that, that primary goal, um, both obviously uh, to support uh, the learning of their, of their peers, but also if you're just trying to run an efficiency program, if you undermine the core mission of that institution, you're not gonna get buy-in and the recommendations that you make won't sustain. So in order to have sustainable change in a school, it again has to support um, learning. Um, uh, other core principles of our approach are year-long deep engagement. So we work with one group of students within each school. So typically that's 10 to 30 students. It's often a classroom. Uh, sometimes it's an after-school club um, or um, uh, a lunchtime club. Uh, we work with all different kinds of students from uh, the kind of um, student government leaders uh, to kids who haven't found their place in the school. And we've really tried to make the program accessible to all those different kinds of um, communities within the school. Um, we start with energy literacy, and we teach that through grade-banded STEM-based lessons um, that are presented in a video format. Again, we're, we always try not to intrude on instructional time. So all the materials are provided in a way, we call it flipped video, uh, the concept being that um, uh, students can watch the video, uh, the curricular content outside of the classroom and then apply it within the classroom. But that gets implemented in a variety of different ways. It just creates a lot more flexibility and puts less burden on the teachers. And then that's followed up by um, student-led activities. So again, that core group of students, uh, the PowerSave team, educate their peers and their teachers, uh, sometimes their families and community members about um, energy and energy efficiency and how it is the most effective and cost effective tool to drive down energy waste um, and improve the environment. Um, student empowerment is, and, and skill building and, and the development of communication, communication skills is, is every bit as important as the energy savings. Um, and it's also um, one of the reasons why the program is so successful, um, because uh, impassioned, educated students armed with data, that's really important, uh, are the best ambassadors of the energy efficiency message and of, um, of behavior change. And then finally, we also um, encourage students to explore opportunities in green careers um, and the educational and the professional pathways that can lead them there. Um, this image right here is of our traditional uh, roadmap guide, um, and that lays out kind of a, uh, a nice schematic of the design of the program. So those purple circles that you see, uh, those represent um, teacher trainings and workshops. Uh, so we start with a professional development workshop uh, in the fall, and we have uh, in usually uh, January, we have the mid-year recharge where teachers gather together to kind of cross-pollinate best ideas, uh, solutions to challenges, and look ahead to the spring semester. And then we have an end-of-year celebration where we recognize outstanding student achievements and um, uh, team achievements and creative projects, and, and it's a chance for everybody to kind of celebrate what happened over the course of the year. The green circles represent um, curricular content, so those are those video lesson plans followed up by quizzes and hands-on activities. And then those blue or kind of teal uh, circles are student-led outreach activities um, that take place over the course of the year. You can see on the right column the content um, of the program. So it takes students from energy basics at the beginning of the year and how to perform an energy audit to in the spring semester subtler applications like um, energy demand and understanding why when you use energy can be as impactful as, as how much you use and various renewable energies and how they impact that sort of evolving grid. And it all culminates in a final presentation uh, where students 
uh, present to their peers, teachers, uh, administration, school boards, city councils, any audience that they can that they can gather to talk about the kind of key uh, key takeaways and sort of the uh, and the uh, the outcomes of their program. Um, and often that also involves presenting their final energy savings recommendations to their school. Because uh, again, uh, a benchmark of how impactful they are is the impact that they have on actual energy savings. I mentioned data and how important that is. Uh, one, another sort of key tenet of the program is to understand the, the power of data in, in analyzing problems and then identifying and communicating solutions. Um, and that starts with these energy audit tools. So you can see we have a light meter, a watt meter, an infrared thermometer, uh, some water um, measurement tools. Um, and all of these help students to gather data uh, from their classroom. Um, but again, all of this has to be in the service of what creates the optimal learning environment. So for instance, with this light meter, they're not just going in and recommending that people turn off, um, you know, half the lights in their classroom. They go in there and they take uh, a variety of light level readings within the room, usually a classroom, and then they compare that against the Illuminating Engineering Society's recommendations for optimal light levels for whatever that room is being used for. And then their recommendation comes out of comparing those two data sets. And um, so it's a, it will improve the learning environment and usually save energy at the same time. But giving students the experience of that kind of data analysis is something that holds them in really good stead whatever, whatever, they feel that, whatever field they wind up applying it in. Um, and, um, and I think that kind of understanding a data-based uh, approach um, to creating solutions is one of the most impactful aspects of the program over and above the energy savings. Another, um, another key aspect of our program is sustained ongoing support uh, for schools and teams. So we have those three training sessions that I mentioned, the professional development workshop, mid-year meeting, and end-of-year celebration. We provide stipends uh, to the participating schools, uh, and that's typically we have one teacher at each school, but if there's teams and they share those stipends among them. Um, we present student and school awards at that end of year celebration that I mentioned. And then our local project leader, in this case, Doug, who you'll be hearing from in just a moment, are always available with either remote or in-person support to provide assemblies, to answer questions. Um, we have an online uh, platform now, and so he's able to support schools uh, remotely 24-7. Um, That's maybe not 24-7, but, um, uh, but he is very available. Um, and finally, um, a key aspect to a successful program is being inclusive. Um, and so that means bringing together the whole school community. Energy use is something that crosses all sectors of the school, all boundaries. And I think one of the nice things about an energy savings campaign is that it forces you to bridge all those silos that can exist within a school community. Um, so for instance, we picture custodians here because custodians are sort of the MVPs of energy savings. Um, nobody knows more within a school about how that school uses energy than the facility staff. And they're often not recognized for that. People don't know that aspect of the role that they play. Um, and we've had great experiences with custodians who found themselves just connected to the student body through the program in a way that they wouldn't have been otherwise. One of my favorite stories is a guy named Oscar. This was actually out in California in Norco, but um, he was a pretty um, shy retiring custodian who really embraced this program and uh, was responsible for handing out energy stars to classrooms that were caught being good in their energy conservation um, adherence. And everybody wanted those stars. And over the course of the year, Oscar just became um, a bit of a rock star at the school. It was, it was hilarious to go there and see the kids flock, flock to him when he would walk around campus. And then I remember asking him to speak at the, um, at the end of year celebration. And he just refused. He's like, I am way too shy to do that. And it was so funny because he just wasn't used to 
that level of recognition and accolade, but he really appreciated it and, and just contributed immeasurably to the success of the program. So um, uh, food service staff, as we mentioned, bus drivers bringing in that kind of transportation piece. These are things that we're starting to include in the program. And then, of course, your traditional educational stakeholders uh, like administrators and, and teachers and obviously the students. Everybody needs to play their part. And none of this rests heavy on anyone's shoulders, um, but if everybody just contributes in little ways to help support that core team of students, then all those little incremental energy savings ultimately add up to something uh, that's, uh, that's a really big deal. Uh, so with that, I will hand it off to Doug to take on the next slide, which is a very exciting one. Yes, we actually have a, a couple of uh, exciting updates to the program. So the first is the Empowered Portal. Um, and this is something that we've been working on for a couple of years now. Um, and we are piloting it this year. So we're wrapping up the pilot um, and it will be uh, rolled out to all of our schools next year. Um, and the Empowered Portal is basically taking the regular version of our program and just shifting it to this online environment where um, it's really easy for teachers to implement. Um, there's automatic grading of quizzes, the video lessons are included um, in, the, in the benchmarks. Um, and it also gives the students everything that they need um, as far as instructions and materials to really take the activities and run with them and really make them their own. Um, so we're very excited to roll this out to all the schools next year. Um, and we really think that the, the teachers and students will see a lot of benefit from, from the portal. Um, it's also kind of a, a good time to be going online with uh, all of the COVID-19 shutdowns. So um, this will serve as a valuable tool for next year. But in addition to rolling this out, um, the, we, we've adjusted a lot of the materials to be home facing. So we developed um, a new version of the program called Empowered at Home. Um, it's all the same benchmarks uh, and very similar content to the traditional program, uh, but it is, it's adjusted so that teachers can uh, give it to their students remotely and the, so that the kids are doing home facing activities instead of things that they would traditionally do in school. So, for example, in the traditional version of the program, there is a school audit. In this version, they all the kids do an audit of their home. Um, in the traditional version of the program, the students present to the full staff. In this version, they do a presentation to their families about saving energy. Uh, so um, we're really excited about these new materials. Um, not just because they're helping schools out this year, but because with all the uncertainties surrounding next year, um, as far as you know, whether schools will be open, um, this really allows our program to uh, work no matter what. So if the, the schools are back open, we've got our traditional model to work with. If they're not, we've got our home version to work with. And if there's some mix in between, we can adjust for that as well. Um, Scott, go to the next slide. Um, and so, so far the reaction has been great. So um, these, I picked out three three quotes that we've gotten back, and they're they're a pretty good representation of the feedback we've gotten from teachers so far. Um, so Ross Cruz at Winslow Middle School says, you know, it's a, been a great program to instruct in and out of school. Um, another teacher says that all of she and all of her students are learning and having fun, and they're definitely signing up for next year. And then um, Carolyn Tagmeyer says that uh, their kids are having fun, so are their families, and that the message of saving energy was definitely heard. Um, and I think that these give you a pretty good feel for the fact that um, in shifting to the Empowered at Home program, we were able to maintain that level of engagement with the students that um, they like so much in the program and the traditional version of the program and that we've maintained the rigor um, and focus on energy efficiency through STEM lessons that uh, have always been present in our program. Um, so the feedback so far has been uh, overwhelmingly positive. And uh, if any of you want to try this out at your own home or with students or if you know someone else that might want to try it out, we've made um, the home audit version of the materials available for free. Uh, if you go to bit dot lee slash empowered home audit um, that'll bring you straight to uh, all, all of our materials for the home audit 
Um, and we're also going to be uh, providing this link after the, the presentation. So if you don't get it down now, don't worry too much about it. Um, but really, we think it's a good way to get a, a feel for what our program offers, um, particularly in this remote learning environment. Um, and with that, uh, I think, Veronique, are we good to open up for questions? Well, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, if there are any questions, um, I, cause I, I didn't have anything, I don't have any other slides, but I certainly could, um, you know, entertain questions. I could even go to the website if anybody was interested to see that. Um, Mike, what does it look like in terms of uh, activity on the chat? There we go. Yeah, and if anyone, um, again, we'll be sending these slides out, but if you want to um, sign up for the program for next year, this, the link at the bottom there is available. Or if you just want to learn more about the program in general, that's my email address and phone number. Yeah, and uh, Doug, I'm actually glad that you mentioned the, um, the, the home facing resource that you've developed. I think I'm, uh, I'm going to check it out and put it on our virtual, um, our remote learning resources page. And if anybody else wants to check it out on our website, we do have, um, it, it's kind of an ongoing compilation. As we become aware of new resources, we plunk them up there. And it, it, it's, it's kind of overwhelming how much stuff there is out there right now. But I, I really do screen them for the ones that seem to be most applicable and relevant for uh, schools in New Jersey. And um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be adding this one. But if people are interested, you can go check it out. Is there, we also try to put resources that are not just for uh, class, uh, for teaching directly, but also for resources that relate to like, um, I think we have one up there that's relating to, to green cleaning, green cleaning the buildings during um, the COVID lockdown. It's a series of recorded webinars. Um, and we also have some resources for administrators um, in terms of navigating uh, the shutdown and, and implications for everything from budget to policies. And just to okay. give a little more background on those materials that Doug mentioned uh, about the home energy audit. Um, I mean, our, our program is always free to schools. We, you know, luckily we're, we're uh, funded by uh, our utility partners in New Jersey. So any school that's interested in participating, there's no charge to them for any of the program resources. But in order to make, you know, there's, there's many more people obviously right now that are struggling with being at home, with having heightened energy bills and, and maybe a greater sense of financial insecurity um, because of the crisis. And so, you know, in partnership with the utilities, we realized you know, we, we wanted to give some part of the program to benefit those families. Like, as we showed you, parts of the program are, um, I did a little bit wonky. Um, but the energy audit where you go through and identify the energy savings opportunities in your home, anybody can do that. You don't need any special tools, uh, the way that we made those materials. And it's very kind of intuitive and, and, um, and easy for a family that, that wouldn't otherwise be engaged around something like an energy efficiency program uh, to implement. And it's fun. Um, so we, we, made, we pulled that section out and made it available to anybody in New Jersey and, um, and California too. Because again, it's just something that's useful to people. So if you're looking for an introduction to see what the program is like, uh, then please take advantage of it and share it with anybody that you care to. But also understand that you know, when you sign up for the program, because of the generosity of New Jersey Natural Gas and South Jersey Gas, um, everything within the program is, is complementary to schools. All right, folks, so we, we have a small enough group here that if you want to want to have a quick conversation with uh, Veronique, Scott, or Doug, um, you can just go ahead and unmute your mic. I don't foresee any chaos happening from that. Um, and I'll just hold space for a minute, see if people want to take that chance. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Wait time on a WebEx is always weird. 
<laughs> I, I would love to get some crack time. We always have to give people a little bit extra time to go find that mute button. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting because – yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. No, I, my my comment was going to have nothing to do with what we were talking about. <laughs> so if you're, you have a relevant comment, please go ahead. Uh, not welcome an irrelevant comment, but I was just going to say I'd be curious to know for anyone that's still on the line um, who they are and where they came from. Just I'm curious to know who has interest in programs like these. But Veronique, yeah, let me good. hand the mic back over to you. Well, I guess I could. No, I was just going to say that uh, my um, I had reached out to the College of New Jersey, which is where our office is based, about how I could um, return business calls from my personal cell phone. You know, that in a way that was root, either rooted through the campus. Or, you know, so it was apparent to people when I was calling them back that I'm not a prankster, that I'm a legitimate <laughs> entity <laughs> from. And this was one of their recommendations was because apparently the College of New Jersey does not have the, the, the capability to, to do that. Um, so they were suggesting one of the options was to like have, you know, send hold like a WebEx or some kind of, you know, web platform where people could call in at a, a point, like kind of like an appointment, almost like office hours, you know, so people can come in and ask their questions. So this is. Yeah, we're getting some intros in the chat. So we have someone here from Hackettstown, works at um, the pre-K and first grade building there. Someone else said thank you, that they're going to be passing it on to their head teacher at their uh, their regional school. Um, so, yeah, folks, if you want to post that in the chat, that would be great, too, just so we have a sense of who's in the room. Um, as that's going on, uh, just my little commercial for uh, learning.njea.org. This is where we are hosting all of these, uh, all of these workshops. You can find them. You can find them on the uh, with, uh, on the upcoming webinars tab. Um, there be a count. There's a calendar there, and you can uh, follow along. Uh, you can also find the old sessions in the sessions recordings tab. Uh, we'll also be posting some links and things there for certain workshops. So, like this workshop, uh, we'll uh, we'll have some some of the links that uh, that Veronique, Scott, and Doug shared uh, posted on uh, on the site, so you can go back and refer to those. Um, <clears throat> and we hope to see you uh, in upcoming webinars. So we we're running daily between now and the end of the end of the month. Um, and if we see that there's a need to keep going, um, we're going to we're going to keep going with these webinar sessions. So we hope to see you on there. Uh, if you have any requests for us, if there's any topic that you really, really are dying for, please, um, please share that with your local leadership, and they will get it to me, and we'll start working on getting some some of those additional topics in the queue. And finally, if you go into your Mars profile, you can manage your subscriptions there, and you can get subscribed to updates for the learning.njea.org page. Uh, every week there is a weekly update email that comes out um, that shares all of the uh, all the webinars for that week. So you can find all the information about upcoming learning opportunities there. So we have some more folks posted in. We have uh, Upper Freehold Regional School District. Uh, Vernon Township Public Schools. Um, yeah, it's good to see people from around the state pop it in. One thing I wanted to mention really quickly, uh, we didn't get, we didn't mention it uh, during our presentation, but uh, we do have grade abandoned materials. So um, at least in our program, we have a pre-K to two version of it, uh, three to five, six to eight, and then nine to 12. So it's not, it's not the same thing for each grade level. It's, it's adjusted to uh, you know be a little more challenging as, it get, as the kids get older. Um, and, you know, we do go all the way down to, to the pre-K to two. So um, there's no restriction on grade level. Well, that's great. Thanks, Doug. Um, and this, you know, this stuff is, is like a, a home audit is a great project to give a kid right now while, uh, while they're at home anyway. So um, you can keep them busy and uh, maybe save yourself some money and teach your kids some things. 
Um, so it would be, uh, be an, an interesting little approach um, and a nice opportunity while we're all stuck at home. All right, folks. Well, that looks like uh, that looks like all of it for today. So I want to say thanks again to Veronique, Scott, and Doug, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming out to uh, join us in this webinar. Hope everyone stays healthy and safe, and you have an opportunity to get out and enjoy the nice weather today. All right, have a good one, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.